Will Wright was working on Spore. Um, I was visiting him back around 2003, and it wasn't called Spore yet. It was called uh, Sim Everything. And um, he showed me um, a box, and the box had cover art on it. It had like what system requirements, which were like something crazy, like you need this many teraflops and this many, you know, much like terabytes of memory and crazy stuff, and graphics processors that didn't exist. And and he showed me, and I said, "What is this?" And he says, "This is the box. This is the game." And um, he says, "We always start by um, doing this first. And then, of course, we have to, like, then make it possible for you to open the box. And so I'm holding this thing, and I'm saying, so you mean the game doesn't exist yet? And he says, he says no, 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 it's in the box. You just can't open it yet. And, and I thought that this was a very profound way of thinking about things, um, that it's kind of up to us as the people who make things possible to be thinking that way. And I, I've been thinking about this whole... Um, getting computer graph, actually, I have this little, I just remembered, I have this little character that I carry around with me. He's like the first thing I ever made, first thing I ever made on a 3D printer. I was very proud of this. I was like hanging out at the Banff Center for the Arts, and I'd been making these like interactive animated figures and doing procedural character animation. At some point I thought, oh, I can just print this thing out. And I got to the Banff Arts Center, um, for like a little summer thing. And it's like, oh, they had one of these things. And so I started taking all of these cool things on my web page and I started um, and I started printing them. And what what you realize is when you print things out in a 3D printer is that suddenly your computer graphics thing, it, it comes out of the screen. You're like in the ring, you know, comes out of the screen. And it, except not as scary. And it has um, a size, which is fascinating, you know, because all this time, how big was stuff? Now I knew how big it was. So I started making little, I made a little zoetrope, you know, and you, and you spin them around and, and there's like, I posted that online. People could see little movies move. I started doing the 4D objects and I started thinking that this actually reminded me of one of my formative influences. I'm sure all of you have read Snow Crash, right? You've all read Snow Crash? Like, you have to have read Snow Crash. And if not, that's your homework assignment. Um, and basically, Neil Stevenson in 1992, a year before what we now think of as the web, said, let's posit a world where people just can share this reality, which is unlike the web, the way it ended up showing up the next year, is like our physical reality, except, of course, we can enhance it. Um, and so I had, and in the earlier work that I was doing that, um, that Sharon refers to, I had been doing things like thinking, wow, okay, I'm really interested in, um, what's the bad picture of it? But I'm, I'm really interested in making things that are like the physical world, but somehow have magical qualities about them. Like why can't things rise up out of the water and turn into shapes? And so um, I actually went and ordered my own little 3D printer, which I now have at home sitting um, on my, my living room couch. So I actually now make stuff at home in a 3D printer. Um, how many people have a 3D printer at home? Awesome, of course you do. It's great. He's actually the first person who's ever actually said yes, which is great. So it's just you and we got to talk afterward. Which one do you have? Uh, okay. Oh, it's fancier than mine. Um, so um, I would actually argue that the person who wrote these books um, is probably the single most influential person in the last decade, not only for getting millions and millions of kids to read, which in itself is very important, but also J.K. Rowling did something really interesting. She said, okay, let's just talk about um, what do we want? We want um, newspapers where people wave back at you. We want uh, maps where when you look at them, you see where people are. And she was writing this in 1999, like 13 years ago. And she just said, oh, well, we'll, just, we'll just say, oh, it's magic. It's okay. But it's exactly what people want. Things just do what you want. And in some sense, what she was doing was educating a generation of kids to say, what should HCI be? What should human computer interfaces be? Well, what do you want them to be? Forget about like how they work first. Think about what we want. And now, in fact, 13 years later, we take it for granted. We have newspapers where things move. We have maps where you can see where people are. And they're just, they're not even considered out of the ordinary. The world caught up with this vision. But the key was she was doing basically what Alan Kay um, has always said, which is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Um, and of course, Arthur C. Clarke had did the same thing with geosynchronous satellites. You just talk about stuff and you start bringing it into your world. Now, what I noticed was that for the most part, the people who are most with the program on this stuff 
were the um, are the artists. This is like a, a, a section from a, a shot from a video that this art student did online where he starts just he, he basically starts making things happen in the air in front of him as he talks to you. And this was actually done by, you know, lots of pre-planning and then 60 hours of post-production. But he's creating this vision of suppose information were right here and I was having a conversation with you. And this has started showing up in computer games. This is Heavy Rain. There's this lovely short film called World Builder where a man actually just builds an entire world for his beloved by creating um, augmented reality right in his hands. And, there, and there's this actually really wonderful guy who, workshop is down the block from our lab at NYU, Marco Tempest, who does these wonderful magic tricks where he mixes reality and augmented reality and, and, and plays around with it. But of course, there was someone who was thinking about this well before any of these people, and that was George Lucas. Um, I don't know if you remember, anyone see this movie? This was back, you know, back when he was making good movies. Uh, <laughs> And the interesting thing about this idea is that we see this and we immediately get why we're interested in this. Because this is promising a world in which these guys are just sitting around. They're having their conversation. They're not like, now we have to go look at the screen. They're looking at each other and they're talking and the information is showing up in that ambient space. So, you know, when... when um, um, C-3PO is playing with the Wookiee and they're just playing a game and the stuff's showing up there. When the, um, the Death Star, you know, circling around Endor is, you know, it's interesting about this shot. It's fascinating about this shot is that um, um, you see all these people not even thinking about the fact that there is this holographic thing floating in midair between them. Like that's perfectly normal, right? Remember this film was made like, what, uh, 77? And yet they all have these little monitors with these displays. And you gotta ask yourself, why did they need monitors with little displays if they lived in a world where projected holograms could show up anywhere? And of course, the reason is because in 1977, if you didn't have little monitors everywhere, audiences would be very confused because they, they needed to see things that they recognized. But in fact, the promise of this, you know, is, is shows up over and over and over in, in pop culture, of course, um, um, a bit later than this, um, you got um, Star Trek The Next Generation, which introduced the holodeck and, and really, really cool hairstyles. Um, I'd like to point out, by the way, that um, um, this uh, Lucas did not come up with this idea. This was a film from 1957. Can anyone name that film? It's... Mm, uh, 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 uh. Give up? It's Forbidden Planet. And that's Dr. Morbius, played by Walter Pidgeon, and there's and, and there's Anne Francis floating in midair because Dr. Morbius is using the the the, the advanced technology from Mysterious Extinct Rakes, the Krell, to kind of project an image there. And there's uh, Leslie Nielsen as the intrepid young hero before he turned to comedy. And and what's interesting is that Lucas not only took the idea of uh, of the cute young chick floating in midair without a screen, he actually stole the shot. I'm sorry, he borrowed the shot um, as an homage to this earlier film that was 20 years old at the time. So a lot of people have been trying to do things like this. At NYU, we had this, uh, this, this project that we did earlier about, oh, about 10 years ago um, called Holodust, um, where the basic idea was that we would scan with a, a laser, um, an infrared laser into dust, and every time we scanned and we hit a particle we liked, we'd flash a visible laser and sort of light it up. And we got some, some interesting low-res stuff uh, happening with that. So the point was that you could actually put your hand right into the display. Um, uh, USC has been doing some really interesting work where they have this very, very fast spinning um, disk and everybody can see a different point of view. So this is beyond what we were doing because we were just creating um, something that floats in the air and everyone sees these glowing particles, they're actually creating a separate viewpoint for everyone. Um, and it's interesting that Joss Whedon in his 2009 um, um, sci-fi mini epic uh, Dollhouse um, basically reiterated the kind of holodust idea. There, these are two mad scientists in love um, and you can tell they're in love because, you know, he's examining the floating brain, you know, and she's looking at him, you know, with adoration. And he's, I think he's looking at her brain activity. It's all very wonderful and romantic. And so, but of course, um, those great futurists um, um, who came before, the brothers Wachowski, um, said, well, why don't we just stick plugs in the back of people's heads? 
which, um, you know, just do this kind of stuff. I mean, it's very rich. People's brains are very rich. We have all this like very rich mapping of, of where the, what the different parts of your brain map into. Um, it turns out this is a flawed idea, partly because when you pull out of, you know, the occipital lobe there and you go through the whole optic nerve and the retina, these are actually very, very important parts of your brain processing. So to stick something back there is actually really a bad idea because you're missing a big, big part of the, of the image processing that your brain does. The best thing is actually to try to like go in the front like, like you do. And it's, it's actually, then you get full use of the whole, of the whole brain. Um, and also there are these issues. Um, it's actually quite difficult to do this well. Um, brain tissue rejects implants um, um, after a few weeks. Um, but so, and, and you have to go into the skull, which is really um, not uh, consumer friendly. <laughs> but nonetheless, there's this promise that we want to be able to see um, fantasy superimposed on reality. We have this burning issue to have like these. We know that this would change our world. We know that, you know, if only we could do like essential things like find that Pizza Hut wherever we wanted. Um, this is what people really, really want. Um, and they want it now and they want it with extra cheese. Uh, so so um, there's a video I'm not going to show you because you can find it online um, and I don't have time, but there's a wonderful cautionary video that this guy did about making um, um, tea um, in the future when you're just wearing augmented reality goggles. And as you walk around, it's taking you through every step and you realize it becomes this nightmare. It's like he's just got everything floating in front of him and then he like, gets this moment of quiet to make tea and then all the ads show up again. And, um, and by the way, was that... I'm just curious. I, I don't know if you're allowed to answer this. Was that New York Times article leaked, or was that? Did you guys want people to know about that? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Did, if we knew about it, we talk about it. Oh, that's right. Good point. There's a New York Times article that said that said Google's coming out with augmented reality glasses in June, and I was just curious if the New York Times did what they usually did, which is like, we'll just write this, and if they don't say anything, well, hey, we win. Um, <laughs> So that's that's the press for you. So I'm um, so so there may be things that people could talk about or not talk about meaningfully with quite with silences. Um, but I want to talk about the form factor of such things. I mean, here you're seeing from this guy's point of view. But what does it look like when he's um, when when he's wearing this device? And so hearing aids. When people wear hearing aids, they try really hard to make them invisible. Um, and why are they trying to make them invisible? They're trying to make them invisible because nobody wants anyone to know that you're hard of hearing. You know, you consider it dysfunction. It's nobody's business that I've got this, you know, this thing that I'm working on. But there's something else that people do, like the early kind of, you know, wireless, you know, hands-free headsets. Some of them just look like this. You know, it's like, hey, I'm just walking around wearing this big honking thing because I look like an air traffic controller because I'm cool. So there's something else going on here. Here, they're not trying to make it invisible. They're trying to make it very visible. And in fact, there is this concept that when you have, say, the hands-free head headset, at some point, it becomes fashion. You know, like the jawbone display, the jawbone um, headset is fashionable. You want people to know that I'm cool, I have this. Because being able to walk around and talk to people and keep your hands free is not a dysfunction. It's a superpower. So one could actually argue that fashion is very important here, that the goal is not necessarily to make the glasses invisible, but to actually make them into a cool fashion statement. And that actually helps with the transition, you know, as you know, before we get to the magic contact lenses. So in fact, just to illustrate the importance of fashion, this was a very, very, very good device that came out in 2001 that nobody wanted. Um, and that, of course, is the tablet PC. Um, and um, people were like, why do I want a PC where I can't even type something? What's it for? Who is it for? And then, of course, their, their um, competitor came out with something um, about seven years later where they built an entire ecosystem of desire around the iPad. So the iPad, I, nobody's thinking, oh, it doesn't have a, a keyboard. What they're thinking is, I just want it. It's got those pretty rounded corners, and I want it, and it's so smooth, and it's glass. And of course, it was built not as a computer at all. It was built as a consumption device, and they redefined the, um, the economy of how you consume information, and they did it at the right time. They did it when you had the videos um, that, um, you know, that, that you guys actually helped with. Um, and and all of the, and the music store, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and games. Um, so now, 
how do you get there? How do you prototype these things? Well, the technology for doing this exists, but the technology for things floating in space in front of us, it's still being worked out. And so there's this long history of people trying to, you know, like, let's just build, um, you know, U University of Illinois, you know, they built a, a cave. Um, they started this movement where you just put a big projector on each wall and you track people's heads and then they feel like they're in a space and then you can start um, creating these holodeck like possibilities um, you know early early on back in the days of VPL um, in uh, the mid to late 80s people were just doing everything they could even though the technology wasn't right that this is not a consumer item this will not be a consumer item but they were at least saying what's it going to be like with available technology for me to like reach out here and see a cyber version of my hand and it was very valiant that people were doing this and I think we always need to do this um, and sometimes these things work out well Sometimes they don't work out well. <laughs> at least they're trying. Um, not available at any store. Um, and um, but but then you get to these questions of what what are our goals? And if you argue that the goal is a shared social reality, certain things are interesting, but they don't get you there. Like um, you know, so Vuzix has this wonderful kind of thing, except you can't see the person's eyes. So that's a problem because you're not. They're able to see a reality. Um, but you can't actually really just look at them. And a really significant part of our brain is is devoted to, you know, we've got this whole parietal lobe in the middle here that's like there's stuff like that's physical. It's like, what are my fingers doing? You know what my fingers are doing. You know, there's gaze detection. There's like subtlety of movement. We've just got this immense amount of special purpose hardware that we've evolved to just do the physical thing face to face that we're actually not using any of when we're just staring at, um, you know, web browsers. Um, and so, so Vuzix, they tried this, which is interesting, but it's still, I would argue this is not the social interaction because people still can't see each other's eyes. So you're seeing things out of your eyes, but you're not able to read somebody's expression. So of course, um, people started doing retinal displays. You know, the hit lab pioneered this, a number of people pioneered this, where basically you try to have the, the unobtrusive display that, um, and then you have these innovations which in themselves look clunky, but they represent important things. Like the significant thing to me about this is that even though this looks clunky, that element right there actually allows you to see his pupil which means you can, a future evolution of this, you could look directly into each other's eyes. So that's sort of starting to deal with the social question of, I wanna see you because I wanna be able to read your facial expression. Um, and, you know, and then there's the, the um, micro-optical has, has these displays which some people are using now and, um, and the air scouter and, um, I, but I would actually argue, and I, that there, these things can get smaller and smaller. Like, you know, in a few years we could do something like this. This is a, uh, this is, um, this is me in a paint program, by the way. Um, we don't actually have this as a working prototype. Um, but, you know, so, so, you know, it's just something floating in front of your eyes. And if you make it fashion, then maybe that's okay. Um, and the other part of this isn't just display. The other part of this is tracking. So there are problems with, you know, the inertial. This is, that's, those are not inches. Those are centimeters. So that's about, you know, this big in the longest dimension. And so the problems with these things, unless you make them very expensive, they're super, super low latency, but they'll drift. And even a little bit drift over time is problematic because it, it multiplies very quickly over, over a few minutes, like the thing's pointing in the wrong direction. However, we have another technology, at least another one other technology, which is really, really good at preventing drift. And that's, you can use like little miniature cameras and put them on things. And so, the, so this guy is basically getting you your 200 frames per second, like response time that you need to lock the virtual objects, you know, so that this could be a real object or a virtual object. And as they move, it's staying in the right place. And this guy is basically presenting, presenting the drift. And for all I know, you guys are working on this stuff. Um, but what really, what people would like to do is, and, you know, and Babak Parvis is working on, for example, at the um, University of Washington, um, are things like this. This is actually a very, very early stage prototype electronic contact lens only designed to see whether it's, it's large because he puts it on the eyes of rabbits and then he sees how long the rabbit can wear it. And it turns out the rabbit can wear it for 20 minutes. And I'm not sure how he checks in with the rabbit to find out that the rabbit is complaining, but apparently the rabbit complains after 20 minutes. And it's like, okay, fine. Here, here's your 20 bucks test subject. <laughs> Um, but we do ultimately, I mean, it is interesting to eventually move these things in to be completely unobtrusive. And so eventually we'd launch something like the HoloLens, you know, like, wouldn't it be great if we just, and of course, this is exactly what Werner Vinge talked about um, in his 2006 book, 
um, um, Rainbow's End, where he says, let's go 30 years in the future, everybody's wearing it. All right, so all of us, we've got our little contact lenses popped in. We, you know, it's, it's enough time that we've miniaturized it. Of course, if you look back and you think about, um, about this diagram, you realize that that actually has to be diffractive optics. It can't be normal optics. It has to be a little hologram thing because there is no room there to actually focus. So that's a future technology that's at the nanoscale. But, you know, we know theoretically how to do this stuff, um, how to sort of get coherent stuff so that it'll focus on the retina from there. We just, there's a lot of engineering to do. So then he starts looking at the sociology of when we're all mixing the real and the virtual. But meanwhile, we fake it. You know, people use these kind of transparent screens. Um, we and our, and our, our um, colleagues, we collaborate with sometimes at the MIT Media Lab. We've been doing these things. We just put the giant, you know, 45 degree piece of glass. And so I'm looking at you and we see stuff floating between us. And that works pretty well because you're actually focusing at the right distance um, for a lot of things. And one of the things that's really changed everybody's research is that uh, Microsoft ended up um, investing in this little company and they um, just turned the depth camera into a commodity item because they were able to make tens of millions of them and with custom ASIC chips. And so, so now all of my students have at least one of them. I've got one at home and one in the office and one here. And you just like, they're like, they're like um, M&Ms, you know, they're just everywhere. So, so we don't actually, you, most, for most of our own research, we don't use their software. We just, you know, take the wrapper off and we just use the depth camera and run our own software. And they're wonderful. They're a little rough, but they're, but they're cheap and they're easy to get and you just plug them into your computer. Um, and of course, there are people who've been trying to bring this stuff for decades. Um, there, there's Steve Mann, there's Thad, and they. And the interesting thing is about these these people is that is that you need what they would need for this to really work. They'd need a kind of consensus group. You'd need it for it not to be, oh look, I'm the person who's wearing this stuff. You'd need to have some sociological context where we all are. And I think that it's so it's not a question just of technology. It's a question of how do you get to the point where that's the normative thing. That's just the And so what is the utility that makes us all say, of course, I'm wearing this thing. And so there's nothing strange about it at all. Now, you could make you, you could basically you could um, I would actually argue you could actually make something like this without having to go all the way to the Babbitt Parvis thing is basically what's going on here is if you have some tiny little thing that floats, um, like extends from the jawbone display, all you need is a little source of light. Because in fact, if you go down to the, um, to the nanoscale, um, we already can do things like mirrors and prisms by basically just doing things which are tens of nanometers um, in ordinary materials, and then you can start bending light. Um, so this is this is a this is a real item. This isn't conjectural. This is this is a, a nanoscale um, a mirror. But basically, if you take light from the right direction in the right frequency, it will just bend it, refract it, or reflect it um, by by using by using um, a constructive wave, wave interference. Um, which means you could have something with a form factor like this. You could put a nanoscale gratings on a contact lens, and if you have something with the right with the right frequency of light coming from the right direction, some of that will deflect into your retina. And we did some we've done some theoretical calculations, and it should work. There's no reason why it shouldn't work, but there's a lot of engineering to do. So, so these things are coming one way or another. And while they're coming, um, then what does it mean? Well, one could argue that the big question is, if I'm walking around seeing reality, not just as it is, but as it could be, there's a difference between I'm holding up my smartphone and going like this, and I'm just looking at you. Um, and these are huge differences. I mean, you know, of course, there's the good stuff, you know, the software that now runs on the smartphones that just translates for you. Wouldn't it be great if I can just be like traveling anywhere in the world and I see there's the exit side, there's the bathroom, there's, you know, there's your plane is leaving now kind of stuff. But there's also these other issues, which is we already know that I can look at a random person and um, within limits know right away who they are with known technologies that you guys have developed a bunch of. And so then the question is, what do we do about this? Um, I'm just going to take a little moment here and talk about these, these issues. Um, so everybody here, every single person in this audience, with no exceptions, right now the technology easily exists for somebody with very little specialized knowledge to break into your home, steal all your stuff, and take it all and go, and you, you can't stop them. You don't live inside of an armored fortress. Yes, you have a lock on your door. Yes, they'd have to break your window, but if they don't care, they don't care. They'll just take your stuff. And yet people here are not rushing home 
to protect their home. Like, I don't think I said that. And I was like, someone's like, oh my God. And they're like rushing out the door. Um, and the reason is because you know, that's an un, a well understood security issue. You know that we have societal, in a societal way, set up a whole bunch of stuff that we've put into place so that there are real costs to that person, even if they successfully break the rock, they successfully break the window, they take all the stuff and they leave, they might go to jail, they're going to, their lives will be completely ruined if they're caught. There's a whole bunch of things stopping them that are not technological. So I'd actually argue that the issue that shows up here, the solutions cannot be technological. The solutions have to be everybody gets together and says, what do we want as a society? Because the people breaking in will always be able to overpower the people with the locks sooner or later. And it's not going to, you can't make in, inviolable locks. So these issues, and you guys are actually a very important component of this, these discussions have to be very public and people have to be talking about them so that we can figure out what we all want so that we can go keep moving ahead with our technology without everybody looking over their shoulder and mistrusting it. Um, so that was a little rant, but hopefully I'm talking to the right people. Uh, so, so now, now this, this kind of augmented reality everywhere has all kinds of implications. Right now, when kids play social games together, they're all like looking at the same direction. They're all looking at a screen together. Wouldn't it be great if they could be looking at each other? Um, because studies show that, um, many studies show that kids actually learn better when they're directly interacting with each other than when they're all just sort of looking at something else. Um, J.K. Rowling has said, I think one of the characters, I think it was Hagrid, said, you know, the future is very, a devilishly difficult thing to predict. So we don't know what's going to happen. We do know that there are some interesting changes, and I'll get back to this a little later in my talk, that, for example, you know, right now we live in a world where there's stuff like this. It could be in one future reality. We walk into a room and we think we see this, except each of us have different favorite books, and actually this is really what's in the room, um, and except that until we, like, we both look at the same book and that becomes the same book but maybe other books, you have your selection, I have my selection, and we're gonna find ways of integrating the virtual into the real. Now, predictions notoriously can go wrong. Um, in 1965, um, Western Electric had this brilliant idea. They said, what we'll do is we'll take the, the television, we'll take the telephone, okay, television. It's two things people really want, right? And we'll put them together in one device. And um, nobody bought it. It, it died. You know, this was an actual magazine ad for this incredible new device, and it went nowhere um, because they were making, they were right that people kind of did want to see stuff on TV in the same place that they wanted to talk to people, but they didn't have the necessary technology that made that possible, which, of course, was the mobility. Um, so once you're carrying the television around in your pocket and the telephone around in your pocket, now it starts to make sense that they become an integrated device. So it's really, really hard to predict these things because something else will come in and change the game and your prediction will be completely wrong. But all we can do is keep trying things because, um, you know, I don't know. When I was a kid, everyone thought the future was going to look like this. You know, like, there you go. They have the, the capes. And the, how, many, how many people remember this kind of vision of the future? Like all the older people raising their hands, right? Right, and of course, I actually wanted the future to look like this, but that's just me. Um, and, and so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show a few demos of some of the, the ways that we're trying um, in our lab at NYU, and again, we're also collaborating with Hiroshi Ishii and some of his students at MIT Media Lab, um, that we're trying to make some of this happen um, without actually having the, um, the, the ways to, I don't, we'll see if this demo works. We had a lot of like technical issues. So this, so I can, for example, go here and I can start, um, let's say, um, you know, draw something, but the objects I draw could be smart objects, right? So I could sort of say, let's, let's make this into kind of a 3d object and let's, you know, give it some physics or something and, you know, and, and so we can't really do this, but we can start thinking about what would it be like if we could do this. And I point out that everything I'm doing now immediately would work over um, video teleconferencing. We just can't do it in the physical space between us. But I'm interested in this because it means that we could start thinking about how to, um, well, I mean, the kind of stuff that you've been thinking about for many years. We can then broaden the question of, how do I use the fact that I'm looking right at you and you're looking right at me and we have these hands and we have these bodies and we have this eye contact and start rethinking interfaces so that they augment what we'd really like to do, which is what people really want to do is, is communicate with each other. So let, let, me try, let me try another one. Let me see if I can get this working. I have no idea if I'm going to get this working. Okay. 
pretty good. Let's try. Maybe that. Maybe something there. Okay. It looks like a cave drawing, doesn't it? But of course, you, of course, now we have modern technology. So this is the like the thing those people wanted to do 31,000 years ago, and those French caves that Werner Herzog talks about. Um, it's like they really want to do this. Like, that's so cool. Very attractive view, right? You know. So it's just so much fun that you have this space where you can start doing things. And what's nice about this is that you can start, you know, you can start answering questions like I teach like mathematics concepts and computer graphics. And there's certain concepts that it's actually kind of difficult to get across. Um, and it's nice to actually just have them right in the space in front of you. So for example, um, I can start drawing um, a shape in the air here and like that. And then I can say, okay, great, no, but I can make that a real cube. I could actually move that. And I could start doing things like say, well, this is just one example of, of a topological space of, of shapes. So this is um, a regular, a regular um, 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 polyhedron, and it's got a dual, so we can actually create the dual by actually just directly saying, okay, we go from this to this, and I can talk to them about these kinds of interactions between objects, the, the interaction between a cube and, and, a, and an octahedron. And then I could show the math somewhere else, and I could start building an entire lecture, or if I wanted to, um, uh, I don't know, let's say I want to talk about how the eye works, for example. This work? So I could say here's um, you know, here's an eyeball. Isn't that creepy? Whoever it looks at wins the prize. And then you could like you know pull it out and start talking about like how the eye works. Um, and 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 you could imagine building this into entire lectures about about these concepts. Um, or for example, let's see, what's a what's a good one? Um, yeah, suppose I want to teach some physics. I could say, great, let's just um. Let's just make an object in the air here. Make it a 3D object. And it, we can start, it has behavior. I can interact with this object. So for example, um, let's just uh, stop this object and say, now we know there's a physics concept that the relationship between that period of rotation and that, um, um, and that um, um, length is, a, is a, square, a square root relationship. So if I make this, for example, if I make this twice as long and then I swing it, it starts um, going at the square root of two times slower. And I can directly show this to people and start building mechanisms for people and show this kind of thing. So this is the kind of thing I'd like to be able to do while I'm directly facing my students and having a laboratory right here between me and them. Um, and, and you can really use, if you do it right, you can actually use the space between you. So let's make you know an object here. And, and this could be like a planet that comes right towards people. And I just love the idea that you have this space between you and people that you can work with. I mean, can I get rid of this? Go away, go away, go away. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, um, so we have lots of examples like this of, of, of trying to see what do things feel like when you play with them. Um, mechanisms, physics, making invisible things visible. Like, for example, um, let's try this one here. Let's see if I can get this working. There we go. Create this. Give me a little spin. So, so now I've created some kind of like virtual mechanical object and I can take this object and I could lift it up and I can start doing stuff like, um, like simulating airflow, for example, toward this thing. And, and I'm running a, just a very, very simple particle physics simulation, but now if I start changing the particles and changing things about it, I could start giving much more interesting um, lessons. And in fact, I think, this, I'm not sure remember if this one works. Um, it might work. Um, this idea of, um, let's see if I can get this to work. Um, so imagine you have um, a flow field and this whole idea of making invisible things visible. Let's see if I can see if this works. Hold up some magnets. I don't know. So there you go. Oh, I can, there you go. You can start creating the magnetic lines of force between objects, which is really cool. Is it showing up? Oh, okay. I don't know. It's a little, it's a little finicky. There you go. Okay. Wait. Yeah. They're very weak magnets. <laughs> Otherwise, the whole thing would be, ah, oh, there you go, oh, that's it. So this idea that you could actually just integrate physical objects and virtual objects, I find very appealing to the whole thing. And then we start thinking about what can you do? What are the applications that become possible and interesting and engaging and you can interact and you can get students interested in stuff? So, um, so for example, let's, let's try, 
I make an object here, and that object can actually be an object with its own a little bit of autonomy. So you know, we could be sort of like you know this this happy object, um, you know, and he, and except that he's if there's nobody around, he gets really sad. Um, and then maybe we just, I don't know, um, give him something to look at. Oh, come on. Look, there's my finger. He's not, very, he's not very smart, unfortunately. He's a kind of stupid object. So he knows there's a finger, but he's not tracking it very well. I'm very sorry. But anyway, he gets, he gets happy and he goes off somewhere. I'm like, wow, hi. Anyway. Um, <laughs> um, so so this, I, I, these, are, these are all just experiments in process to like say, what can we track, what can we, I mean, so example, you can actually do some really interesting things. I could, for example, say, let's say I'm trying to teach sorting algorithms. Now there's something about sorting algorithms, if you actually see the objects move, they get really interesting. So let's see if we could, um, let's just have an array, um, array of objects here. We sort of give them some behavior, and now um, um, they're actually really responding to my finger. You know, so wherever my finger is, these objects are responding, and we can do things like say, okay, look, I'm going to start exchanging these things, and I'm I'm actually driving the steps of of the sorting exchange step, so I could do heap sorts and um, 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 exchange sorts and bubble sorts, etc. And I could get these things happening automatically. I could get them having a response to me. But the point is that that people are now really actively engaged in these things because they see them happening in front of you. So we've given we've made this. Um, challenge to our students to ask them to try to make little lessons using these things. But the one rule, using the system we're building, the one rule that we give them is that whatever you do, it has to be real time. You're not allowed to do any post-production. So we've set up things like they can do camera cutaways to a second camera view because that's how, you know, if you're giving news presentations. But it has to be live. The system, all the virtual objects have to move in real time. And I'm going to, I think I can show a little video here. Um, of what some of the stuff that some of our grad students came up with. Um, let's see. There it is. Hopefully this will all just work. Um, yeah, so the first one you're going to see is a grad student from um, from MIT who's one. Xiao Xiao, she's one of Hiroshi Ishii's students. And the second one you're going to see is a grad student from NYU, Murphy Stein, who's one of my students. Um, so let's see if we can drag this over to the other screen here. And hopefully this will just work. How do we depict the 3D information from a globe onto a 2D map? One way of doing this is by drawing a cylinder around the globe that's centered at the equator. We project the globe onto the cylinder and simply unroll the cylinder to form the map. This is called the Mercator projection. One useful thing about the Mercator projection is that straight lines on the map correspond to great circles on the globe, which made it especially useful for navigators to plot straight courses as they sailed the oceans. Topographic maps are a kind of map that shows elevation. Let me show you how. Let's see this map in 3D. And let's make it bigger. And let's make it steeper and also add more contour lines, which correspond to the steepness. Now let's crush it back down and bring it back to a topographic map and add color, which can show the absolute height, which contour lines alone can't do. Bring it back down. Now let's rotate it towards you. And now let's fly over the region to see how the colors and the contour lines change together to show the shape of the region. Cool, huh? So I want to um, talk now very quickly and take you a little behind the scenes of some of this stuff. Um, OK, so this is actually from my, my, that obsessive compulsive blog I keep. Um, very often, I, um, I just post little programs that I wrote that day. And uh, this gives you a little sense of how some of the underlying technology works. This, for example, is the actual system that the little interactive fish that you saw, he's actually um, a, a sort of a way, he's actually a, a software system that you can use to, this is all just Java applets. So the way this gets made, these kinds of stories, is that um, um, we, um, we have these hotkeys. You see the hotkeys on the left there? Um, if I hit the, the H key, He's happy. If I hit the A key, he opens his mouth. If I hit the O, he goes, ooh. 
And um, but what we're our goal is to be enable ordinary untrained people to be able to make their own movies. So um, so the way we do this is I can start the timeline going and he can be like looking at the ball and like, you know, examining it. And, um, you know, backing up again and then looking at the second one and maybe he's like really unhappy because um, the, the ball isn't bouncing and then we can make the ball bounce. Maybe could we make the ball bounce? Uh Oh, let's go make the ball bounce. And then he's like really happy again. And so we're creating a movie as we do this. And so the goal of this research is to create these really, really simple interfaces for people to like do their own thing. And then, you know, I don't know. And then maybe, maybe they both stop bouncing and he gets unhappy again. Um, oh, what about that one? Then we surprise him, we make it grow. And now he's like happy again, whatever. Come on, be happy, be happy. So what we've just done is made a movie. We can go back now and we can, we, we can um, replay this movie and we can also edit this movie. So the goal here is to try to create, and a lot of this kind of like, let's quickly make a content and edit it, we think is a lot of the way people are gonna be presenting things. In a way that you, you can think about what we were doing with the augmented reality system was creating a presentation system for the future where you open up the ability for people to use smart objects and smart characters. And by creating a really, really smart um, interaction devices, we think that's actually necessary in order to use the space between us. So there's going to be a whole kind of authoring for these sorts of things. Um, so as long as I have like maybe five minutes left. OK, um, so let me just quickly then talk about something completely different as long as I'm here. Um, and um, get rid of that. And I want to talk about. Um, at some point, um, at some point, I realized that books are a problem. Um, Two thousand years ago, scrolls got replaced by books. What they did is they chopped them up and made codexes, and you had the first random access device. How many people knew that? You know, and so then suddenly it revolutionized technology because you could actually have um, instant access to technology. But it's held us back because ebook readers keep trying to look like pages, but they shouldn't look like pages. So I've been playing around with ways of making. Um, books, making ebooks look more like what they're supposed to be look like, which is the original intention of the author. This is The Great Gatsby. That's the entire novel. Um, so there is a screen full, and there is, I'm reading through it, and I can also go through it anywhere. And I'm using the metadata of the, um, of the chapter headings to, um, to figure out color. And now this is easy, because Gatsby, though most of you know Gatsby's very small. Gatsby's a tiny novel. It's only like a quarter of a, a, quarter of a million characters. But I thought it'd be really interesting to take this idea of exploring um, a novel and, um, and do it with something a little more um, ambitious. Um, so um, let's do it with Pride and Prejudice, which is actually three quarters of a million bytes. Um, and so there you go. So this is all of Pride and Prejudice um, here. Um, and as you can see, we can, we can wander around in it. We can you know, move our cursor and see it. I mean, I had 61 chapters. I'm sure some of you knew that. Um, and, but we can also ask questions of it, which are really interesting because we're seeing the whole novel in one screen. And that means that we can start having a community of readers and scholars and commenters who have a geography just like you can talk about Google Maps because you're all looking at the same geography of California or the United States. So you can say, where does Elizabeth Bennett, the main character, show? Well, she shows up everywhere, of course, because those are individual words of a novel because she's the main character. So of course, she has a fairly random distribution everywhere. But what about her object of desire? Mr. Darcy. Well, he, he comes and flows like he's supposed to because he's the elusive Mr. Darcy. And you can actually see Jane Austen's method here by making Mr. Darcy disappear for long sections of the novel and then throwing him back. And then what about the, where they're supposed to end up, which is Pemberley, where they're going to live happily ever after, his big estate. Well, I thought when I first read this, it was everywhere. It turns out it's only mentioned very briefly here, then hardly at all. And then there's a big cluster right around here. But why right around here? It's because if you actually look at Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy, they show up everywhere in the book, except right here, right in the middle, chapter 35, is this long stretch where neither of them show up at all. Why do neither of them show up in the, the very dead side of the middle of the book, a book which is about them? Well, it's because that's where, how many people know Pride and Prejudice? By the way, I, I gave this talk to a bunch of high school students and almost everyone raised their hands, so there's a generational thing. Um, and um, so he, he, neither of them show, well, Mr. Darcy seems to show up here, but it turns out it's actually his father. 
So it's not him. This is the letter that Mr. Darcy writes to Elizabeth that actually makes her realize for the first time who he really is. So she, she's going to start falling in love with him, which is why she agrees to go visit his estate. So you actually see that just by looking at these things, if you look, if you look at the, the texture of these things, you can see immediately where there's dialogue, where there's explicit packages. And I, I, passages. And I'm really interested in people being able to just let go of the old fashioned book and think of a narrative as something you can visualize directly, because you guys of anyone in the world are the people who are going to be able to then fill this with the interesting information and um, matching of semantic information that makes these maps really, really relevant to people in a way that old Mia simply couldn't. So I'm going to stop there and open it for questions. Thank you. wide ranging and and the demo gods clearly were playing with us in advance but they decided to smile on you That's after right. all so smiling right now. Yeah. Well, yes in reality. so uh we have about five minutes for questions and i'll give the mic to anybody who would like to ask a question uh so that we get it on the video anybody when i see your demo right now the obvious thing that seems like you guys should be doing is clear board with the connect is that how you're going in the near future? Um, yeah, well, um, Clearboard is clearly an inspiration. I mean, one of the reasons that I'm working with Hiroshi is that, of course, we, 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 you know, we, we share this, in, this interest in, you know, you see the mirror view of the other person, et cetera. Um, we're deliberately pulling back right now and starting with presentation tools because our current research is to figure out what gestures a person makes would be most expressive to another person. So we're starting with the more asymmetric and then as we understand the vocabulary, we're going to gradually make it more symmetric. And we want to end up with a perfectly symmetric interaction scenario. But that's, so that's, that's where we're going in, hopefully after a few years. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, the question is, could you do this with websites as well as with books? Because they often have like ads around the outside and structure. It seems to me that, I mean, I was particularly interested in recovering the structure of linear narratives. But it seems to me that what I'm really trying to do here is what, if you have some amount of information, and it's a relatively stable piece of information, that's the key, is that New Jersey is not going to move west of Colorado. And that's why the whole overlaying map, G, you know, GIS works because the earth stays where it is pretty much. And so novels are interesting examples of repositories of knowledge. That it's not so much that they're linear, but that they're stable because then we can start building, meaning overlaying, you know, the visible human, you know, kind of stuff on top of them. So I think the, to the extent that things actually form stable geographies, this kind of stuff becomes directly applicable. If they're forming unstable geographies with a lot of plate tectonics going on in that website, then you probably have to mark up all of those commentaries and metadata so that they start moving around with them, which is, I think, a much harder problem. OK. Any other questions? One more Nobody has any questions? I have a question. I was thinking as you were um, doing your demo this time, have you talked to the Khan Academy about whether um, or any of the people doing like the online, um, you know, MIT's open courseware, any people who are trying to teach things online, it seems like they could use your system right away. I'm going to talk to Peter Norvig soon. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's true. That's right. Yeah, He's doing right. that. Yeah. So yeah. I thought I would give you guys first shot before going to, you know, mm -hmm. Sal Khan. Very generous of you. you. <laughs> okay, um, great. Well, thanks very much, okay, Ken. Okay, thank you. Thank you.